think we recognized pretty early on that because the theater itself was important to Jean when she grew up, you know, she referenced having seen Marlon Brando and the men in this theater when she was 12. That's what started her on her path towards acting. Her sister Marianne spoke about babysitting Jean was easy because she would drop Jean off at the theater and pick her up after a double feature. So uh, the idea for the festival itself perhaps matured over time as we moved further with the building, but remembering Jean in the building, if we were successful in saving the building, was always part of the deal for us. Okay. There are so many aspects of her life that I find inspiring. Yes, she's very physically beautiful, but she didn't have any hand in that, right? That was just a gift. Uh, but what she did with her heart and her talent and her support of living things that didn't have a voice is probably what speaks to me most keenly. And I love Marshalltown and I, and I did see her sort of bringing her back home as a way to celebrate the town as well. Yeah, so it's multifaceted really. We went through, clear through from kindergarten through high school together and we lived around the corner from each other so um, you know we going back and forth to school and stuff and in school and we played together a lot so she was an outgoing personality she was smart full of it <laughs> from junior high through high school we both did theater and yeah she and she was going to go ahead and become a, a film star which she did and she was um, very, very good and very determined, so. She came to visit, I was living at, in Des Moines at the time and I had um, our first child and she came to visit and came to see our daughter Angie and, and that was really fun, you know, really fun to have her come there. I and I, and I saw her, uh, various times when she'd come back, in Marshalltown, when she'd come back, go see her at her mom and dad's. I mean, I'd watched her act, you know, the whole world's a stage, and I watched her act on and off the stage um, all the time we grew up, so, um, no, it was, it was fun to see her, and I was proud of her, and, and, you know, she did a great job in everything I saw, so. As a, a person who cared about others and did something about it, and she was in her own right a, a terrific actress and just, just an overall good person. Well, I'm the daughter of Mary Ann, Jean's sister, so Jean was my aunt. And I first met her when I was a baby, apparently, pictures I've seen. But my first memories of her were when I was six years old, or I think six, in Los Angeles when she was, just before she filmed Paint Your Wagon. And our fam my sister and I, Melissa, and my mom went out to LA and stayed with her and Romaine and my cousin Diego. Um, she was renting a home at the time, and all of my memories then are what a six-year-old would remember. <laughs> a turret with a spiral staircase and a great mm -hmm. pool, and lime trees lining the yard and going to Disneyland and seeing the ocean for the first time because we were living in Newton, Iowa at the time. And so I don't remember it being, you know, movie star Jean Seberg. It was just Aunt Jean like she always was. And those are, that's the start of what was always my memory with Aunt Jean was just when she would come back to the States and we'd get together either in New Jersey where I was living then with my family or in Iowa that it was just seeing Aunt Jean again. Well, and then my grandparents lived here for so many years. So we moved away from Iowa when I was eight, but came back often. So I remember the house very well on Calson Boulevard, and I remember working as a child at the pharmacy for a bag full of candy with my grandfather. Um, I still feel like I have roots in Iowa. It still feels very comfortable to come home and sit at the Maid Right counter. Um, <laughs> even though I've been gone so long. So I really consider where I grew up in New Jersey, but you know, being, it's always comfortable coming back to Iowa. It's really, it's really cool, of course, because she was in movies, but I feel like 
even though I didn't know her personally, I knew her a lot through the stories and talking more to my grandma about her and definitely through the movies is a whole other perspective. Um, and I think just for her time, she was so, so talented. Because in our family, this was a very hard story to tell for a long, long time. And I would say after she passed away, there was a long gap before stories were shared or memories were relived or celebrations of a wonderful life were appreciated. And when Gary and my mom started talking, and I used this phrase earlier today, it was kind of a flower that blossomed. And my mom felt comfortable talking about it, about something that was terribly painful and terribly tragic. Um, I mean, talk about something hitting close to home, right? This whole story. So we celebrate Jean's life now, and it's just, it's such a wonderful testament, I think, to time just kind of healing the wounds and the continued interest in her story and the fact that she, she was much more than a movie star or a fashion icon or a, a rebel without a pause, as Jude <laughs> said today. Um, she had so many facets to her life. She was so ahead of her time. I think that's what resonates with me the most, is had she been living today, it, she, what she was involved with would have been run of the mill. You know, it, it would have been, and she would have done it in a quiet way too, unlike you know, some of the sensationalism and support that goes on. But I would say she lived her life as full as she could have lived it. She followed her own footsteps. She was strong, she was ahead of her time. Um, and yes, she was beautiful, but she was really beautiful inside. And that's what I remember of her as an aunt. She just was really beautiful inside. Karen? <laughs> um, I think she's a really, really good example of being somebody who was put into the limelight, but didn't get whisked away with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of young kids and like kids my age even are so obsessed with like the glitz and the glamour that would go along with being a movie star. But I think there's so many layers beneath that and it's hard to recognize that it's still a person who still goes through tragic things and goes through divorce and um, has to fight for like the underdog and I think she was a really good example of kind of kind of expressing the good and the bad that is in anybody's life. Well, with the festival, I think the thing that probably is exciting for me, because I was kind of uh, raised at the same time Jean was, in the same kind of family. Our f families were friends. And I went to her dad's drugstore because I lived in that area and I knew uh, Ed and his, his little idiosyncra in idiosyncrasies that we all loved. <laughs> but um, the fact that, they're, that we're celebrating the life of Jean Seberg is, is just so wonderful for me because to be perfectly honest, I had three people that I looked up to. I was a freshman when she was a senior in high school and she was one of my idols, if you will, because she was so pretty and intelligent. And I saw her in Sabrina Fair, and I was totally enamored with the whole play. And then Sandy Taylor of Taylor's Made Right was another one. But Jean was, I just couldn't understand why people in our own hometown couldn't celebrate her life. And, and so the fact that the festivals became a part of the Orpheum and the history of this Orpheum starting up again was so special to me and that's why I wanted to always be a part of it because I also remember when she came back uh, and she presented one of the Jean Seberg Awards and it was to a person in my class and um, of course in the 50s when we wore skirts they were like down here you know mid-calf uh, calf. 
and we wore flats, no jeans, no sh nothing like that. And we, all the girls were sitting there and she walked down the aisle and of course we were all thrilled that she was home because she was an icon for all of us. Yeah. And she sat in the second row on the end seat and she sat down and she crossed her legs and her skirt came above her knees. And we all thought, oh my, how cosmopolitan was that? And of course, the wedding was very special. We weren't actually there, but we were across the street and we watched her. I was lucky enough to be at her wedding reception. And it was very French. And it was, it was just, I don't know, it was almost like we got to share a little piece of her movie star dream. And the fact that, that she is now being celebrated in all these pictures, and people are remembering her. It means a lot to me. So um, it was hard because it, uh, her death was very hard. And um, when Nina died, it was very hard. And it was hard to see Ed and Dorothy struggle that way too. But now we can celebrate her life and, and have fun and watch your movies and have fun. And this has been so wonderful. I heard um, her, well it would be Jean's niece, comment to you about how internationally famous she is. She's probably more famous in Paris than she is maybe even in the US, but um, as I commented this morning, a friend of mine went to Paris and she was wearing a Jean Seberg Festival t-shirt. And people kept coming up and asking, where did you get that? We want one. So I said, if they would just take all the t-shirts over to Paris and set up a kiosk, they would probably be able to sell them all. <laughs> because she's uh, revered there. And what's really special is she's now revered here. And that makes me very happy. And I had uh, Carol Dodd as my uh, drama teacher, speech teacher at that time, and she's the one that submitted um, the entry for Jean when, when she uh, was able to get the uh, movie Joan of Arc. And uh, she visited the school, and, and Jean did, and spoke to us, uh, to all the drama department. And uh, I will always remember my impression of Jean. Uh, first of all, she was just beautiful, so photogenic, um, uh, poised, articulate, uh, she was everything that you see on the screen, you know, and uh, that's been a lasting impression of me. I was uh, fortunate enough to win her award in uh, uh, 63, and it meant so much to me. I wanted to send her a thank you letter and ask Carol Dodd to forward it to Jean. And to my surprise, she took the time to write back to me and uh, and just shows you how thoughtful she was. And I do have the letter here, and it's here in the theater. Dear Georgia, I'm delighted to receive a note from the winner of my award, and I hope this reply will be sent on to you. What a shame I couldn't be home for the awards assembly, but we're still trapped down here in Maryland because of unexpected rainy weather. We have our sights set on Wednesday as a departure date for New York, where we'll work another two months. The monetary prize isn't much, but if what little it is stimulates the winner to continue in dramatics, this, it certainly serves a purpose. I felt the need for it because I remember when I was in school how much emphasis was put on sports and how little of it uh, was given uh, attention to uh, the uh, speech department which it deserved. Congratulations, Georgia, and best of wishes for your future. Fondly, Jean Seberg. And uh, so that's, that's my connection with Jean, a lasting impression of meeting that young woman. <laughs> well, my experience with Jean Seberg began with my experience with Ed Seberg and Dorothy Seberg. And uh, my experience with Seberg Pharmacy, which was one of my um, important places as a kid. I lived about two blocks, three blocks away on the corner of 12th and Main in Marshalltown. 
And uh, my dad was a friend of the Seabird family, as my mother was. Uh, I think my dad did some legal work with them. As a matter of fact, when my dad died and we um, closed his office and found material there in a file was the original contract that uh, Gene was signing with Otto Preminger. Um, uh, to, he became a guardian for her because she was underage. And uh, my dad had either given some advice because he had a copy of this and on the copy were notes. So um, my relationship began because um, my father at, in the morning, on Sunday mornings, Ed would open up Seabird Pharmacy for any drugs and whatever, and all of the do a lot of the doctors, lawyers, would come down and have coffee with him. They'd trade jokes, they'd trade fishing stories. There were a lot of good friends that were there. And my dad would take one of us children uh, down to, with him to pick up the newspaper to have some coffee and, and whatever. So I got to know Ed, and then I loved going to Seabird Pharmacy, as did all my brothers and sisters, and um, he was kind. He was a very, very kind, warm man, treated us kids as guests in his store, and I always kind of had a dream that someday I'd work there. Um, and when I went to MCC in 1969, um, another guy from our neighborhood was moving on, and so Ed would hire two, three, four uh, high school, college folks to work part-time down there, and I got the job. So I worked there for two years. And during this time, um, Jean lost her child, and um, Ed knew that I sang. I was a folk singer, and he knew that I sang, and they were looking for somebody to sing at the funeral. So. Uh, Gene asked if I would sing at the funeral. And um, we met choosing the music and then uh, singing at the funeral, which is quite surreal because it was an open casket funeral for a, a prematurely delivered baby because she wanted to prove that it was a, a white child because the FBI had started a, a rumor that it wasn't. Um, we spent some time together during that time, um, and she liked the music that I wrote and that I sang, and uh, we became friends. She wanted to help my musical career, and um, you know, you see her on the screen, and she's lovely, but it doesn't compare to being this close to her, because she was um, obviously quite beautiful, but she was quite a beautiful, lovely human being too. And she was very vulnerable, very sensitive, and, and we bonded a little. I was a vulnerable 18, 19 year old kid and, and uh, felt honored that she'd want to spend time with me and probably had a little crush on her because she, you know. And so we, we kept in contact after uh, that was over for a while, and life went on. I got older, you know, and, but that's how it began, and that's what my relationship with her was. And she was quite sensitive and quite vulnerable and, and quite afraid because one of the most powerful organizations in the world was after her. And, and I remember her bodyguard, Guy, uh, carried a gun, and I wasn't used to being around people carrying guns, although my dad was a former FBI agent, uh, but I wasn't used to it. And, and in Marshalltown, she was afraid that she was being surveilled and that there were people out after her. And, you know, it was kind of hard to imagine it. I wasn't used to that at that time. And then we... Um, Shortly after that, she took 10 people to Chicago to meet with Jesse Jackson because she was going to help his organization. I was one of the people. We went in two different planes from Niederhauser Airport. Uh, it was a real cold, windy, rainy morning. And she wanted me to ride in a plane because she gave me some paperwork that was a copy of what she was 
going to take and she wanted two copies in case one of the planes went down because she was afraid you know she was she was, she was afraid right. and yeah. and you know as I've grown older I understand why she was afraid at the time I didn't totally understand why she was afraid but I understand now you know, bringing Jean here and celebrating her, um, I think was a great opportunity to um, bring the family together, bring the family back to Marshalltown, um, and really celebrate her in the way that she deserved to be celebrated. Um, you know, Pip Gordon was the first one to take the festival, and and Nancy, and then and that working committee that worked and just really give her the honor that she deserved. And she's our hometown girl. And so um, when I have bus tours, and here I am today in the same role, and so when I have bus tour groups come in, uh, I always like to make sure they come to the Orpheum and they get into the gallery and they get to see the Jean Seberg memorabilia and they get to learn a little bit about her. Uh, so everybody leaves Marshalltown knowing a little bit more about Jean Seberg, and we can thank Nancy for that because she does an amazing job of telling the story about Jean. There's lots of memories and, um, you know, over the last 18 years, um, just having her be a part of this facility and a part of our community. And then the other thing that's really amazing is how now other community members have embraced the Gene Sieber or the Seberg Pharmacy. Uh, the Raglan family has purchased that building. Uh, they've made it into a business, an eye care and optical business, and they've taken photos of Jean and expanded them into these huge, beautiful murals. And so now she gets to, to live on through the Seberg Pharmacy building and become a part of that 13th Street district that just continues to blossom. So all of these positive things have come out of our first love and learning about Jean. When I was the editor of a student newspaper in England and I was looking for some well-known name, person who would be also uh, of interest to our, our readers and Jean had an awful lot of publicity at that, that time. She had just made uh, St. Joan, Bonjour Tristesse and, and Breathless. Um, so Breathless in particular was attracting a lot of publicity at the time. Uh, she was also very attractive, which I thought was something that would have added appeal to our student readers. So I wrote to her out of the blue and said, would you like to write an article for my magazine? Um, I think the fact it was Oxford was probably a bit of an attraction rather than some unknown university or college. And, but even so, to my surprise, she said yes, um, and in due course produced this article, which we ran and it was very successful. The, as I hope, the sales of the magazine uh, went up. And Jean herself was pleased, you know, because um, she, um, uh, she said, and this was reported in uh, the um, Times Republican newspaper here, that the article was one of the best things she'd ever done. Now that was uh, very <laughs> pleasing for me to hear. So. Jean got something out of it as, as, as well as, as us on the magazine. She was uh, genuinely charming and genuinely natural. Uh, so that was, you know, a pretty powerful combination. Uh, the other thing I felt was that um, this was by, by now four years into her, her Paris life or her, her French life, and she did seem to be totally at ease with it. She had acclimatized and adapted so well. Um, she was very, very comfortable in the French environment. Mm -hmm. But it was a marvelous occasion. She was, um, was, 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 um, was delightful. Mm -hmm. From the, the word go, they were taken uh, with La Petite Americaine, the little American. Um, and uh, first of all, they were tickled by um, her French accent, which in the early days was, of course, not perfect, um, and the grammatical mistakes she made, uh, which they found rather charming, um, <laughs> because she was very far from the stereotype of the um, American, uh, or indeed the British for that matter, who determinedly speak only, only English. Um, she picked up French very rapidly, um, and um, they loved her for that. So as a person, they, they loved her. 
and um, her films, three, her first three films are all uh, set in France. They, they, they're about France, so it was all very uh, French, uh, French focused. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was also, of course, uh, part of a, uh, a couple with the very prominent novelist, Romain Gary. So they were, um, they, they, they were the golden couple of Paris for a period of time. And finally, for this Diamonds Are Brittle, I finished and uh, I was very lucky to be so, with an American actress. But Jean was just always perfect, you know. And I must even say that um, she had a, a sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, humor, you know, uh, which in a way, which was laid back, but always with a little, uh, you know, we would say in French, you know, with a, with a twinkle of the eye, you know. And this, this uh, humor of her, this laid back humor, uh, also transpires in the movie. Uh, she plays the daughter of a, of a gang leader, you know, like a female Al Capone, you know. And uh, so she's uh, weaker than this lady who is running the show, you know. But at the same time, she inherited also this discipline from this strong lady. And she is at the same time stronger than Claude Riche, the leading man. And this, uh, these two levels, she brought it out fantastically, you know. And uh, it's, she had a certain distance um, because Claude Riche was always fighting to be up front, you know. And the cameraman said, careful, Nicholas, it's your first movie. Careful, because Claude Riche, one day he's going to eat your camera, you know. <laughs> Even when, for the rehearsal, I put him back, you know. After two or three rehearsals, he was up front, you know, always. And Jean saw that, you know, and she played with that because we had this kind of complicity, you know. And when I told Claude to hold back, you know, we had a little complicity uh, correspondence between Jean and myself, you know. Uh, here we go again, you know, Claude Rich always wants to go first. And it's even, uh, when you remember, the, there's one scene where they, after they broke up because Claude Rich is, is, is cheating on her. And then, of course, he has a girlfriend, and, uh, and then the, the, the jewels uh, he go from one person to the other. And when they sort of make up again, uh, uh, Claude Rich is in a rocking chair, you know. And uh, I wanted them, with each line, that they would, as, as uh, Jean comes close to, to Claude Rich, that they would approach with each movement of the rocking chair, you know, and they never got close enough, you know. So in the rehearsals, and there are photographs of that, you know, uh, uh, you could see my hand pushing the rocking chair, you know, to make the two really meet, you know, and kiss, and kiss. Because there, there was a certain distance, you know, between Jean and Claude Rich, you know. And uh, she also, and that's the merit of my screenwriter, Charles Spark, as I said, you know, the flesh around the bones uh, to, to give word to this very fine-tuned characterization, you know. And uh, uh, there's a scene on the ship where I say, okay, uh, Claude Rich says, I want to do uh, something dishonest. I'm fed up with Swiss honesty, you know. And so Jean says in the lines, you know, okay, let's, let's steal something, you know. And, and Claude Rich suddenly, you know, he's not up to the situation. And uh, Jean said, well, yeah, no, 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 go ahead, we go ahead. And of, the, the thing, of course, fails because of Claude Rich's soft-heartedness, you know. When, and then they go up there and they, they, uh, Claude Rich is, is apologizing. I'm sorry, I, you know, I, I ruined the cup, I failed. And Jean says... I knew you were not a thief, you know. And that uh, exactly her character, both in real life as as character of this movie, you know, both the irony and the honesty, you know. At the same time, playing with the fiction, but at the same time being true to her own character, you know. That was just pleasure. Every shot was a, flip, was, was a pleasure with her, you know. 
it, 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 it touched my soul because I'm a community activist. I was a community activist in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I worked in uh, Southern California and uh, I was the only white guy actually on the, uh, the staff. I was executive director of a youth program called Los Padrinos and we worked at gang intervention programs and such. And we fought for funding. We fought for um, trying to get the right people to support these progressive intervention programs to save youth from going into the criminal justice system. And so seeing her and the things that she did during the 60s, it touched me. I said, you know, hey, it must be in the blood maybe. <laughs> but it was wonderful. And that probably more so than anything else. Then I started looking at her movies. I was going like, wow, this is some fantastic stuff. It's wonderful um, watching her and sharing that with my children. And that was really kind of the thrust of this whole thing, me, 71 now. And I think I got my, my children, they're 22 and 9, 18 and 4, the 3 years old, that they, I hand them the baton like, okay, we went to this, we, you know your connection, and now you're enjoying uh, a uh, rich history. And uh, I just, it's great to see their smiles in their face. They're right now going on a tour to see the different um, uh, places that Jean lived. And actually, last year we went to places where we lived. But they're right next door. The Seabergs all stayed close together. So we were right next door to um, Jean, uh, Jean's dad and, and his grandfather. And, uh, so we were able to trace that last year and go into the cemetery and find our Seabergs. And it was, so, it was so wonderful to have Mary Ann uh, just embrace us and, and see that uh, our, our relationship um, it was, it was, it was fantastic. So my dad always told me growing up that Jean, we were related to her, that we were related to Jean. And um, I, I never really thought about it too much. I did look her up and I was really inspired by some of the photographs from her movies. I'd never seen her movies, but uh, I just thought she looked wonderful. And I even cut my hair like that, and I used that photo one time. Um, I just thought it was so minimalistic. Um, I definitely went through a time where I thought, you know, I want to dress more simply and more elegantly, some of that French style, and um, just keep it simple. And I think um, I got that from partly inspired by her. I think that it's rather clear that what we need to do if we want this to continue is to touch those who are younger than, than we are, right? To reach people who, who have no memory of her. I don't have a memory of her, you know? And so, to, and so to, um, to still find ways to inspire the young generation, like we did last year with your student films. Um, some of us at the college, you know, spend just a few minutes introducing Jean to our students uh, perhaps have a writing assignment associated with that, that sort of thing, honoring our drama students that we do. It is, it is in reaching younger generations, and I think that because the themes of Gene, you know, whether, again, it's, it's filmmaking or social justice or uh, fashion, any of those things are timeless. Those themes are timeless. And so, so thinking about, about the succession is... is, is part of my focus, uh, the fact that Jean's niece and her great niece are here today, those are other generations, right? Generations now of Jean's family are working in concert with us. That's what it'll take. <laughs>